Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It is a privilege today to have someone so on brand with trust and all the work we do. Uh, Cheryl Batchelder, she was in charge of a major turnaround at Popeyes. And I think stocks, if I noticed right, rose from 11 to $61 and then sold at $79. But she's a fan like we are of servant leadership. She's served in leadership, CEO, interim CEO at Pier One Imports. She was president at KFC. She serves on boards or served in leadership and everything from Procter & Gamble to Yum Brands and uh, a host of others. Also, uh, I had the opportunity to speak at a Work Matters event, and I, I know you're on the board or have been at Work Matters, but a huge, huge, grateful welcome to Cheryl Batchelder. So good to be with you. Thank you so much. Well, you know, your 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 leadership and resume, what what we say around here is is it's amazing your on stage presence, but off stage to over 40, 40 years of marriage three amazing kids, grandchildren, and uh, I just love your your onstage and offstage presence of faith, family, friendships, and leadership. But maybe you give us a little background of Cheryl from a perspective that not everybody knows. Uh, well, I usually start with the fact that I'm the oldest of four uh, children, and uh, that's uh, a tribute to my parents. They, they raised four of us to be business leaders in the marketplace. Uh, they raised four of us to be people of faith. They raised four of us who have been married 30 plus years each. And uh, there we have 13 children among us. And so I was blessed and know that I'm blessed by that incredible foundation of strong family in my parents and my grandparents uh, who just really invested in bringing us uh, to the prep through the preparation of leadership, right? What are your values? What do you believe? How do you act? How do you steward things? Um, that is just uh, the very important foundation of my uh, entire life. So who does it make me today? It makes me a, a very family oriented uh, person focused on leadership development in, in both my home and in my work. Um, as you said, we have been married 40 years. We have three grown daughters, two terrific son-in-laws, and four very handsome grandsons. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, you said this in the book. We'll go. We'll get to leadership. We'll get to the book, uh, Dare to Serve, and all that. But you know, you you made a comment about Daddy Max and how he taught you uh, some keys to leadership. That's your uh, father. Maybe give us one tip from Daddy Max. You know, the people that hear me, every time I speak, I share, even though I share the research and all that, I tell a story of impact of my father. So um, I, I, I want let's hear one from you. Sure. Um, it, by far, my father was the single uh, greatest mentor on my life and business career. Uh, walked it with me uh, right up till the last week he was with us. He passed some 10, 10 years ago. Um, and so he was my mentor. I went to him for counsel. Um, uh, I'll give you one fun story and then maybe one more principled story. Um, I was at lunch with Tom Monahan, the founder of Domino's Pizza, the, and he asked me to be his chief marketing officer. And he literally wrote the offer on a napkin, pushed it across the table and said, I want you to work with me. I said, that is such an honor. I'm so excited. I'll let you know on Monday. And he goes, no, you won't. You'll let me know right now. And uh, he basically negotiated like he did with baseball players. And so I said, well, then I need to go out in the parking lot and make a phone call. And I left the lunch table and I went and called my dad. Uh, I reviewed the offer terms, uh, you know, why this was an, uh, a good fit and a good opportunity with my dad. And I came back in and I accepted the job. Now, I wasn't young at that point. I was a full grown adult raising my own children. But that's the degree of wisdom and counsel I saw in my dad, that it was always worth five minutes to go check it out with him and run the traps. Now, my dad taught a lesson nearly every day in our home uh, about business and about how you conduct yourself in life. Um, so the one that stands out to me the most is 
Um, he opened and ran uh, factories in Asia for a very long time um, in the electronics industry. And the business would have peaks and valleys, which means in factories, that means you're hiring people or you're laying people off. Um, and so there would be times of real crisis for him as a leader when he had to uh, close a factory or uh, you know, reduce the team, reduce the staff. And what I would see is him pacing the floor, sweating, looking almost nauseous you know, from the decision at hand. And he would share every bit of that. And that particular night that I remember, um, he was closing a plant in Penang, Malaysia, uh, of people that he knew were really uh, going to be hurt by that. Their families were going to be hurt by that decision. It was a very poor community. And he had come to love these people. And he said, Cheryl, he said, I have to make these decisions, but they should just make you sick to your stomach when you have to make a decision that uh, harms families. And, uh, you know, how do you forget that? I mean, I remembered that for 40 years um, since it happened. And uh, it really, it's like an embedded principle in how I lead it is, yes, I have made some very difficult decisions and just, and had some very tough conversations with people, and I have laid people off. No one wants to do that as a leader, but it's how you do it and the spirit with which you do it that makes all the difference in the world. Um, and that principle I, I used at Popeye's when we had a um, one layoff in the 10 years, but it was significant. And I said to my team, it is how we treat these people that will be the signature of, of this event. Uh, we have to do it, but I want everyone to leave with their head held high and the dignity. We did none of that walk out with your box stuff. Mm -hmm. that is so I've seen it. We, we saw it in a big company you would know uh, when they lost trust for a decade because of the way they did it, not that they had to do it. So I, I, I like this. I remember the first time I had to lay someone off, and I think I can at least uh, feel now maybe good about it. I, I, told me what, I was sick for a month um, to have to do it. And I was in my 20s, and I was kind of director over all my staff was older than me. And uh, it was, uh, I just can remember the, the, the feeling of that, and I have had to do it since. But it, it's, it's a, the work of leadership is heavy, you know, I think. It should it, be a burden. Yes, it's a it's a heavy burden. It shouldn't be alone. People that say they're leading alone are doing it wrong. Lead, you know, we need teams and we need others, but um, but it, it it should feel heavy. I think that's true. So um, there's so much more we could talk about about who you are and all the leadership roles and many people know you here. But I thought something that you just said came out of the, I, I picked this up in in your book and it's a subtlety. But it, it, it's not, I'm going to get into some principles in the book, but it's a subtlety of how you say things that made me just so impressed with who you are. And the word, um, you said it already, oh, you said stewards. It's, it's, it's not this feeling of, these are the people I lead. It's, these are the people, in fact, you said it in the book several times, I can't even remember the wording, but something like, these are the per people I'm I'm charged with leading, or I'm I'm given to lead, or I'm I'm kind of called to steward, and it's it's like the investor. Does. I'm we're there to steward. We're not that. It's 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 such a different feel of humility. And I, I know you've been influenced by uh, you said it there with Collins uh, level five with a you know humility with ambition. But you know, tell us where that that humility came from. That seems genuine, and that is something I see missing in the leaders I walk you know, alongside uh, that I'm consulting or working with? Well, I, I agree. It's largely absent. It's culturally absent to um, honor and uphold uh, stewardship as a leadership trait. In fact, so much so today, I was being interviewed by a large big four um, accounting firm that you would recognize. And on the subject of ESG, uh, which one of the aspects of ESG is governance in boardrooms, and he said, what thing are we not measuring in the boardroom that we should be measuring? And I said, you should be measuring the steward, the development of leaders as stewards. And the reason is because we have very few people with that mindset. And yet we're entrusting huge groups of people and huge amounts of resources to leaders in large companies or institutions, any institution you pick, right? And there's no training up of stewardship, belief, values, and behaviors, right, in our leaders. 
So why are we surprised that they don't steward it well? Why are we surprised that they don't create an environment where people feel treated with dignity? We shouldn't be surprised. We're not training it up. Uh, we're not expecting it. We're not measuring it like we do everything else in the business world, right? And so I, I use the word entrusted. I believe people and resources have been tr- entrusted to my care as a leader. And my responsibility is to steward them well. Um, and if I steward them well, maybe I should get paid well and do well in life. But that's not the motive. The, the motive is I am a leader who uh, has been entrusted with much and, and should steward it to its best possible outcome. I'm not in control of everything, so far, right? But I should steward best I can uh, to a better outcome. So what does that look like in practice? I think it's real important to say, how do you do that? Not just philosophy. Um, and my whole premise at Popeyes that the, that the book is written around is what if we led this company as if the franchise owner who invested in the store, the people, the community was the center of the universe, and we were to take care of them and set them up for success. And I said a million times, we will measure our success by their success. That's the only measure of my team's success is whether those franchise owners are more prosperous when we leave than when we got here. Um, Now, why is that rocket science? I really wonder, right? I mean, it is a business model. They need to perform well to continue to invest in the business, to build more units or to innovate or all those ways that we invest. So why wouldn't I, as a leader, think of them as the point of service, the point of stewardship? Um, but, you know, franchisees in many, many organizations would tell you they are not valued. They are not treated with respect. Their um, prosperity is not measured as a measure of the business success. I mean, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. I've seen that, you know, I work with and have spoken to and consulted with many franchise and franchisees and, and corporate. And you, I, I can't, you know, you see it all the time. And I can see the challenge but they won't care about their franchisees they don't they don't there's a rift that they won't corp there's such a a lack of trust between franchisee and what some people would call corporate right well and i think you'll appreciate you know that relationships governed by a contract right how does a contract have help you build prosperous business conditions I, you know, I view a contract as something I only take out of the drawer and uh, on a really bad day because, right, it, it, it's like a marriage contract. That's the day you're getting divorced. Same in franchising. The day you need the contract, you are getting divorced. And so I want to be well out ahead of that, right? And the only thing ahead of it, and it's why I admire your research and your teaching, is the only thing ahead of that is to have a healthy, trusting, truly prosperous business relationship. Hey, it's Ann with the Trust Edge team here. As you know, we are passionate about helping you and your team perform at your best. And that's why David wrote his new book, Trusted Leader. This true to life parable follows the story of a CEO who uncovers the root issue threatening his organization's success. And in the back half of the book, David provides a roadmap for even how to solve those root issues. Get Trusted Leader for your team, your organization, or even just for yourself at trustedleaderbook.com. So let's take one idea from you, because I saw many, but just one idea of how did you build trust with your franchisees? In Popeye's, you know, you went you went from, I mean, people don't know this, it's a big deal from $11 a share to selling at $79 a share from, I mean, it wasn't, it did affect the bottom line. This service leaders, this dare to serve way of being, uh, it actually affected the bottom line. And people, you know, more more people wanted franchises. More people, you know, they, they spent money on upgrading their stores. I mean, the, the story, the first half of the book story of, of Popeyes really is just this example of people don't care almost to, we want to be a part of this, right? How did yeah. you, what's one idea people could take away to build trust with others that they serve? Well, I think it was Greenleaf who said the single uh talent of leaders that is underdeveloped is listening. So I'm going to start there. The first thing we did at Popeyes is we went to seven cities and we listened to our owners and to the general managers of our restaurants and to our customers. And I mean, literally behind a mirror. So we weren't in the room. All we could do is bring a pencil. 
and we listen to them talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the business, the model, and the decisions that have been made. And we let them give us their best thinking on what was wrong and what needed to be fixed. And, you know, somebody told you a long time ago, the answer is always in the room. And it just is. It just is. If you ask the people closest to your business model, uh, what's wrong, they know. They may not know how to solve it. That's a whole other question. But they do know what's wrong. And they're quick, They're happy to tell you if you have the patience to listen and write it down and take it home. And they just would give anything if you just like act on that feedback, right? If you just take it home and act on it. You know, so like one example is they told us um, that our uh, innovation was not there. We, we weren't launching any exciting new products. Um, Ten years later, we were the leading launcher of exciting new products in the industry because we took that feedback and said, we're going to build the best new product development process that generates successful new product launches in a fast food restaurant. We're going to build that thing. And it's going to help us prosper. And then we involved them every step of the way. They got to taste the new products. They got to see the test results. Um, They got to challenge whether or not we launched them, right? Because it's their restaurant and investment. We're putting these new products. And so we solved our problems. We first listened, and then we solved our problems together. Um, most franchisors want to bring the solution and tell you the answer. And one time, one of my franchisees said, you know, the best meetings we have with you is when you don't bring a PowerPoint presentation. Hmm. That's good. I think it's so, really so good counsel. That's, that's really good counsel. So let's, let's, this gets, this kind of takes that and gives personal to it. It takes a couple of things we've talked about already together. You start the book with this idea of, of basically the biggest problem leaders have is spotlighting themselves instead of others. So shining a spotlight on others. In fact, uh, shift the spotlight. You talk, call it the spotlight problem. And actually, I like this quote that uh, from your book, Dare to Serve. We'll put the links for everybody. But I really like this. So I mean, I talk a lot about, lot about a lot of books here, uh, a lot of things we're working on, but this is really true and really valuable. So uh, the biggest obstacle to a dare to serve leader is yourself. It's so true, this for the, kind of the spotlight focus. And yet, Look at our culture. Look at our kids. Look at your grandkids. What are they growing up in? When I watched football games and people uh, won growing up, they all cheered together. Now, the first thing someone does is point to themselves, point to their name on their back, point to their number, point to the self, self, self. And there's this big focus in leadership and in our culture to focus on ourselves, spotlight ourselves. You know, I, I kind of goes back to what we talked about before, humility, but how do we get over this obstacle of ourself? There's even companies now, it's like build your personal brand as a leader, not, you know, build the corporate brand, build the, the team. What are we going to do about it? Oh, one of my favorite quotes is from C.S. Lewis, and I'll get it mostly right, where he says, uh, humility is the thing that we are quickest to notice the absence of in others and most unlikely to notice the absence of it in ourselves. Um, And that's just true. If you want to know a truth in the world, that's a truth. The truth is our nature is inclined to think of ourselves first. Uh, We're just flawed that way. And so I I, I actually, this is a deep-rooted principle for me. I am a flawed human likely to look out for myself if I don't work against that urge. I often say servant leadership is only an aspiration. You can never claim it because it's a daily aspiration to become a better version of who you are. We are not basically good. Um, And I have arguments with people who actually believe that humans are basically good. I'm sorry. I know I'm not. And I'm pretty sure you're not. Um, And it is hard work to put yourself in a filter of um, people ask me, you know, what is humility? Uh, What is servant leadership? It is simply thinking of others more often than yourself, right? Just putting the other's lens on the situation more often than your self-interest. A simple example at work. Um, How many times does someone come in and ask you as the leader for a raise? All the time people ask you for a raise. 
my number one question when you ask me for a raise is when time, when's the last time you gave your team a raise? Go check that out. I, I don't really want to talk to you about your raise until you put it through the lens of I've looked at the compensation of all my team and where we stack up and I've taken good care of my people. Okay, now let's talk about you. But that's not human nature. Human nature is take care of me, take them, you know, get my raise, get my promotion, get me to the top of the heap, get my resume looking better. That is our nature. So we have to fight it to be a leader different than that. And the best lens I figured out was this uh, counting others as more significant than myself. If you say that in every interaction you have with a human, it changes the context of the conversation. And um, it, do I do it every day? No, I am imperfect. But this is the way to change your mindset because humility is not something we're appear, trying to appear to be, okay? As soon as you say, I am humble, or you wear a badge that says, I won the humility award. I mean, yeah, right. You are not, right? So we're trying to live it in a genuine fashion. And the only threshold for that is, did you think about how that was working for the other person? <laughs> That's hmm. the only threshold. And that works in marriage or it works with your children works at the office, but it's really hard to do. This gets to uh, something else we've been talking a lot about, um, and it's it's love. It's this, this you, you talked about in the book, loving those you lead, and I thought about leaders too. Do we really love those we lead? And by the way, this has been a monumental shift, and not trying to bring it back around us, but for our, for our way we run things. So, I mean, if I go back 20 years ago, my wife would be with me backstage and I was scared to death to go out there and I'm nervous and I'm, I'm like, David, she would say the same thing every time. Stop thinking about the research. Stop thinking about you. Just love them. They can tell when you love them. And this has been a, a thing I've shared a lot now. When I went in the first time I was in a country where the, you know, the president and machine guns all around and you got this, you know, we're just supposed to deal with this issues in their country around trust. And, and Lisa knew I was, she was with me this time. So I'm going to meet the president and vice president, whatever. And she just twicks, you know, uh, holds my hand tight. And she, and she whispers to me across the banquet table, just love them. They can tell when you love them. And boardrooms, sometimes some of the toughest boardrooms in the world, some of the biggest names in the world that I know I'm, I'm going in there. You got to deal with this trust issue with this board. And I would get a text from Lisa, just love them. And it changed, it helped me. And like you were saying, I'm so imperfect at this because you can get to thinking, oh, I could do this and it would give them, give, get a standing ovation or I can do this and it would, that they really love that. But that's not the best for them that day. What's loving them that day? What's loving them in their way? And we, um, she had a, was in a, a study here uh, from Praxis. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they asked the question, the leader, uh, they, in comp uh, kind of compel us to ask the question, is it loving toward them? Is it loving toward the shareholders? Is it loving toward your people? The problem with being in leadership, especially as an owner or entrepreneur, is I kind of have the power, right? It's it's like as an owner of a, a, a company, I don't have to, I think, hey, that's a pretty fair wage, but is it a loving wage? Is it a, is it really best for them? Is it, is it, is it, I have so much power, I have to really work. The point is, I have to work to think, is it loving toward and right. and some of the, some of the new things we've offered from the way we run our, you know, just some of our trust work is is it really we shifted things, simplified things, probably don't make as much money as some of the other ways of doing things, but it the the reason was it's loving toward, and I'm grateful for that shift. We're totally imperfect at it. <laughs> so I love what you said about love because you talked about it as a demonstrated action. Um, I think it's Joel Manby who says love is an action verb, right? It's what you do. And about five years after being at Popeye's, one of my franchise leaders, very important, influential leader in the franchise system, he said, it appears that you actually like us and care about us. Is that true? And it really caught me by surprise. That's like not a routine question. And I thought about it for a minute and I said, well, yes, it is true. Um, quite passionate about caring for you. And it should feel like care and love and friendship. I mean, right, people ask me why I'm so good friends with franchisees at KFC, at Popeyes, at any number of the companies, Domino's that I've served at. Well, because I actually was in relationship with these people. 
I actually did really care. Now, do you know what people tell me the number one obstacle is to caring about others at work? Time, time. And it, it, they just immediately tell me that they do not have time enough. So I did this, one of my executives challenged me um, and I said, well, how do you feel about the time that I spend with you? Oh, I feel very good about the time you spend with me. Is it important to you to have time with me that we can talk things over? Oh, very important. I said, well, how do you think about the people that work for you? Do you think they value getting some of your time? So time is the currency of care. And I, I started giving my team a guideline and I made it up to be honest, but it worked. I said, spend 30% of your week in one-on-one -on -one sessions with the people that work for you as a way to demonstrate that you're listening, that you care, that you're here to help, that you're stewarding the resources well, make that a priority. And they told me that would be humanly impossible, but we got to that. We got to that. It's really just an hour and a half with each person on a team of seven. It takes Tuesday and half a Wednesday or whatever day you pick, right? It is not impossible to do, but it is intentionality to do. And you cannot demonstrate love and care without spending time with people and knowing their names and their kids' names and their lives and this whole person thing, right? Um, so another thing I love to say is you must know the people you lead. Um, and it's really the same thesis. If I don't know anything about you, and if I don't spend any time with you, there's not a chance that you would understand me as a caring leader who was stewarding you and the resource as well. It's not possible. So here's the thing. All of us leaders trying to do a better job is we just need to be the, the leader we'd like to work for. Okay. We all know what good looks like. We all know what it looks like to feel cared for and attended to. Let's do that for our team. It's inexcusable to know that and not do it. I actually have that written in my notes. Uh, I read it in your book. Ask what kind of leader you would follow and be that. <laughs> yeah, be or maybe that was my cliff note version in my side, side notes. But Hey everyone, and here with another quick interruption to share some big news. November 1st through the 3rd, you are invited to the Trusted Leader Summit. And if you know us even a little, you know we're big time into bringing amazing leaders together in a way that actually makes an impact in the world. We're talking about a get together that is packed with immediately useful content from speakers and leaders who've never been all in the same place at the same time. It's going to be incredible. We all want to follow and work for leaders we can trust. So get your tickets before they're gone at trustedleadersummit.com and join us in becoming even more trusted leaders. We can't wait to see you there. So the book is Dare to Serve, How to Drive Superior Results by Serving Others, and it is fantastic. Let's just touch on as we bring things together, you know, what I've noticed, at least in the leaders I've had the opportunity to walk next to, serve, um, even counsel, those that are doing it well are leading themselves well. Mm -hmm. And I often often notice that people that are leading others well are actually, they're, they're, they're better almost at home than they are at work. They're, they're, they're doing, you know, not just doing work well. And I just wonder, do you have some routines that help you lead yourself well? Um, you know, I've had to learn routines to lead myself better. So I think it's a really important thing to talk about. I would tell you routines and disciplines do not come naturally to me. I'm kind of an idea person, expansive thinking, always got something new that I want to do or think about or, so I, I've had to really work at these disciplines. I will tell you the ones that really come to mind. I have, um, I have had a purpose for my work in life for over 25 years. Um, and it is to inspire purpose-driven leaders to live with competence and character in all aspects of their life. And, you know, it's not a perfect sentence, but it's worked for 25 years at guiding me towards where I spend my time. Um, and it's all about encouraging and developing leaders. And oh, by the way, that includes my daughters. It includes my friends. You know, I mean, I'm, I want to be an investor in human beings and helping them reach their potential. So have a purpose. Plan your time around it. That probably was the biggest breakthrough for me is that you have a limit, limited amount of time, right? I don't know why it took me so long to figure that out, but you do. 
So use it well. I made a 100-day plan every quarter for Popeyes, and I mapped out both my personal and my professional time by day at this outset of every quarter um, so that I was putting in uh, you know, the big intentional work first. Uh, because if those are the big rocks, the pebbles will fill in around them, right? That's the thesis. And so put the big rocks on your calendar first, intentionality, uh, because everything else will fill in around it. And then um, maybe the secret sauce for me has been learning to carve out quiet time. Um, I have a daily quiet time that's fairly short, but important to getting the day off to the right start, getting my head in the right place, revisiting what I believe from a faith perspective, uh, what my intent is from a purpose, and then my calendar, um, and reflecting on that a few minutes, uh, set, kind of set the stage for the day. And when do you do that? Time. When do you, When do you take the time to do that? Always first thing in the morning. If I don't do it in the morning, it doesn't happen. How long do you do it for? Uh, today, it's about 45 minutes. When I was in the thick of the big CEO job, it was probably more like 20 to 25 minutes. And I would either do it at home or I would do it, uh, I would shut my door when I got to work and do it at work. But, you know, if you have a chaotic young children home in the morning, it might not be the best place to do that. So, um, but uh, I used to tell people, I said, listen, people leave work to get a haircut. I can close my door for 20 minutes of reflection time at work without feeling like a poor steward. I mean, that's a good steward to care uh, for myself for 20 minutes to get ready for the day. And then once a quarter, I did a full day silent retreat with a guide, a guide, a person that uh, guided it. Um, it's a tradition from my faith that I hold uh, uphold is really valuable at keeping me um focused on the right things and doing the right things in my life. And so I would say uh, one of my favorite books last year was the, the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by Mark Comer, because he just kicks you in the teeth about eliminating hurry and chaos so that you might actually have a clear mind and a clear head to uh, live out what you uh, believe is most important to do with your life. I love it. You know, I know you, you gave us a book there. You've, you're a, avid reader. I love books and love reading. You have another one that comes to mind right off from the last year or two that, um, that you've, that's been made an impact. Well, you know, I, I'm going to be unconventional in, your, in the response because I just read a historical novel called the book of lost names. It was a world war II story. And I make a point every summer, uh, of going to this little house by the lake that we have in Michigan and reading a, a historical novel. Um, today, no one reads, no one studied history, no one reads history. And there's, uh, even in a novel format, there's so much to garner from history about difficult times. You know, um, war times are actually quite relevant when you're going through COVID times. It, I, I just think we don't uh, seek perspective from uh, history and from novels and other sources of literature. So that would be my suggestion. I would love to talk to you all day. I love this. <laughs> There's so much to, to gather and learn here. Any other piece of advice uh, for tr leaders that are trying to be trusted leaders? Well, I guess my, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two. Um, one is that there's a real risk of trying to live your life to please other people. And uh, that is physically impossible to do. And so, uh, I think the sooner you figure out who you're living your life for, and that might be a God, it might be God, it might be a principle of your faith or your belief system, but hang on to that as your anchor, not what people think. Um, we are just uh, thrown around like uh, sand in the waves when we do that. Uh, there is no anchor in living your life for all other people's intent. So. Um, know why you're living for. Um, and then the second thing is to live an integrated life. I, uh, the reason my purpose sa says competence and character in all aspects of your life, we have one whole life. You know, I want my daughters to know me as a person of stewardship and integrity and generosity, just as much as I want you to know that. It's just as important, probably more important that they know that. And so 
Um, I once was told by a boss, not a very good boss, that I should just kind of keep my whole personal life at home. And I said, oh, no, 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 that will not be the case for me. I will be the same person here as I will be at home. And you will know me, my whole person, and they will know the whole person because it's the only way that is healthy. It's the only healthy way to live your life. And so um, I think if you really put a filter on that and say, I'm going to strive again, it's a daily ambition, not something we do easily, uh, but I'm daily going to strive to be the same human being everywhere I go. It's a powerful guide. Thank you for that. Where can people find out more about you? So I have a website, CherylBatchelder.com. My name is hard to spell, so it also Google it. It's Serving Performs is the name of the site, uh, where I have blogged for years, and I have a lot of free resources that you can uh, reach out to, and you can contact me. I actually read the email that I get off my blog site. Um, LinkedIn is another great uh, tool that we have today that I uh, respond to every LinkedIn request that I get that has a specific inquiry. Great. Well, we'll put that in the show notes. Cheryl, Batchelder.com and this book, Dare to Serve. And uh, I want to, I always end with this question, Cheryl, and I know you have many examples, but we talk about trusted leadership. What's it like to be really a, a leader worthy of trust? Who is a leader you especially trust and why? Uh, one of the leaders I looked up to is, his name is Scott McClellan. He runs a division of Compass. Uh, his division services hospitals and retirement communities, food service for hospitals and retirement communities. Um, and I suppose you want to know why. Um, I really, he's very transparent and vulnerable to share his beliefs and his values in the workplace. So he allows you to know him. Uh, he talks straight up to his people. He travels the country to know and lead his people. And so I've taken great inspiration from him. And he has taken time with me to share uh, some of the things that have helped him be effective in leadership. And so it's those people that you get to see up close and that will take the time to share uh, that really make the most impression on you. Absolutely. Well, this has been a special treat, and you're one of the leaders that is the same on stage and off, and we're grateful for that. So thank you, Cheryl, so much for being here and spending the time. And until next time, stay trusted. <laughs>